welcome to the Indoor Garden. I'm Liz Keehan, and today we are very fortunate to get a tour of the U.S. Botanic Gardens. Wally Reed will be our tour guide. He's a horticulturist there, and I think we should go inside and meet him. <laughs> Hi, Wally. Hi, Liz. How are you doing? Fine. How are you today? Welcome to the Botanic Garden. Well, thanks. I'm really excited to be here today. And you're going to give us a tour, right? That's correct. Great. So what do you want to show us first? Well, I guess uh, we can start with the begonias right over here, unless there's something along the way that you see that you might want to okay. ask about. OK. Well, we can go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, one of the uh, an interesting begonia that we have here is called this begonia two-faced. Oh, look at that! It's uh, and these all are all pink. <laughs> all the Rex types. You can notice the Rex types by kind of the silver glossiness in the foliage, and this two-faced is kind of interesting because it's got red backs on its leaves. It does. In fact, it looks like it has hardly any green in it at all. It's uh, quite unusual. It is exactly. Uh, this particular begonia, if it's like many begonias, if you grow it in the full sun, it'll lose its intense color. But uh, this one, if you notice, has got just about the right amount of sun here and keeps its nice, intense silver color. And we have this begonia rex, too. R right. These, these, all these begonias are related to a single rex that was discovered in the 1850s in London uh, in a shipment of orchids. And the original, uh, the original uh, purchaser paid over 10,000 francs in the 1850s for one cutting of rex begonia. You're kidding. No. Uh, wonder what it would be worth today if they discovered it, huh? Well, they look like they're worth a fortune. They're very unusual and uh, very interesting. The name Rex actually means the king's begonia. Uh, uh -huh. That's where the name came from. So mm -hmm. $10,000 could be a king's ransom for that begonia. <laughs> and uh, these can actually be grown in the house, most too, begonia, right? Yes, most all begonias. That's the nice thing about the group. It's a quite diverse group. You'll notice there's a lot of different uh, leaf shapes. Mm -hmm. uh, the begonias are known as the great imposters because their leaf shapes mimic a lot of other plants that you see. And they can, almost all of them can be adapted to grow in the house. Oh, that's why you'll see begonias in so many different shapes. Exactly right. I see. Uh, a, a nice one uh, that uh, if people are interested in this large cane type, uh, this Sophie Cecile is, has been around a long time. It's readily available to home gardeners. <laughs> and uh, even though it's a little large, uh, you can just take small large. cuttings of it and, and grow small pieces of it. We like to grow large ones so people can see just how big they'll get. And this has a very different shaped leaf also. Uh, yeah, the begonias, all the begonias, uh, even though the leaf shapes look even, they all actually are not quite symmetrical. You'll notice this half, they're all asymmetrical. One half doesn't exactly match the other half. And that's a pretty good indicator for a begonia when you're looking to, uh, to see what it is if you're not sure. <laughs> But here's another Rex type, again, the silver foliage and the very oh, exotic foliage. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. If you need some color in your rooms and you've got some bright light, bright one of light, those exactly. would really be stunning. Uh, the only problem around it, this area with begonias is uh, the wintertime can be a little dark for them and you might lose your, your silver mm -hmm. color, but as soon as spring comes along and we get those nice long days again, those begonias will uh, color up. Great. And this almost looks like a maple leaf or something. And is that a begonia also? Well, this is a begonia. Uh, again, uh, the begonias, for, for a defense mechanism, can mimic a lot of other plants. And their leaf shapes will, will mimic other plants in the, uh, in the forest so certain insects or certain animals don't attack them. All right, so it's part of their defense mechanism. That's exactly That's how correct. they survive. That's right. Oh. And here's some fuzzy leaf. Uh, yeah, a lot of begonias have uh, have hair on the leaves, or uh, furry, as you say. Uh, a lot of times that, that fuzz is uh, used to trap water and channel it down into the crown of the plant uh, so it can help uh, water itself. So in areas where maybe it doesn't get as much rainfall as it should, that uh, those hairs on the leaves will channel that water right down into the crown. And the flowers are a really beautiful color. They're almost sort of a peach or rust or apricot somewhere in there. I don't recall seeing very many flowers that color. Uh, begonias have a, di nice. a, diverse, uh, a diverse flowering spectrum. You've got whites, you've got pinks, you've got oranges. And all of them look uh, similar. You'll notice even though you've got two distinct leaf shapes over here, the flowers on the begonia are very, very similar. Uh, the seed pod forms directly behind the flower on most all your begonias. And if you oh, look, yes. you see that? Almost yes. all of them, even though it's a little different, that's a pretty good indicator that you're looking at a begonia. If you look for the flower, see the, the, the flower that looks almost like a clamshell maybe opening halfway, mm -hmm. and then the seed pod behind it is a, is a good way to uh, identify your begonias. 
Oh, and look at this. This is a philodendron salon or something close to philodendron it. Philodendron salon, <laughs> uh, a good house plant in this area. Uh, if you notice where we've got it planted, it's in the shade of another tree. That's where it would normally live in, in, the, in the rainforest. And also, if you're going to take it outside in the summer or grow it in your house, it would need an area of filtered sunlight. All right, it's one of your hardiest house plants, and here it is in a huge, as a huge specimen. But you can get smaller ones for your home. You it's can, wonderful. Exactly. Well, this is great. I didn't realize the diversity of begonias, but they're quite amazing. It's one of the, the most diverse groups of plants. There are over uh, a thousand species of begonias and four to five thousand cultivars. So it's quite a large grouping of plants. It is. Mm -hmm. Well, do you want to take us out to the bog Let's plants go outside, next? Sure. Okay. I know there's some interesting ones in here for us to see. Let me show you out here to the bog garden, Liz. All right. Bog. Now, what's the difference between a bog and a swamp? Basically, a bog has is predominantly fresh water, and that fresh water is moving through that area and creating a, a it's usually in, a, in an old lake uh, bottom, and uh, it's an area where the water actually flows through uh, and, and causes a constant change of the water, where a swamp, uh, the water doesn't change very much and also can become brackish and get actually a little bit too warm. Uh, but these, these bogs here, we've actually, this is our first year with this bog garden. Oh, uh, look at those. Uh, all all these, insect eaters, too. Every <laughs> single one of them. Uh, there are a couple local bogs in the area. There's one in Suitland, and there's one in the Cedarville Management uh, area down in Southern Maryland, where if you wanted to see these plants growing in their native environment, you can. Uh, yeah, that's a Venus flytrap there. I know people like to try and grow these in the house, and they can be difficult. Uh, they actually, the yeah. reason they're so difficult is because they go through a dormant period in mid-October. Uh, and you have to hold back the water, and actually the bulb will die to almost nothing, and then next April you have to replant it and regrow it. And I can make those fly traps uh, close. Would you like to see one close? Sure. It looks okay. like one tried to eat a fly over okay, there. Yeah, there's an old fly Go there, ahead. but uh, if you, inside here are two trigger, are many trigger hairs, and you actually have to hit these trigger hairs twice, and it'll close. Oh, right there up. it goes. And I'll do the same thing on this one. You hit it <laughs> once, hit it twice, and it'll close. Uh, and actually what happens in there is the, uh, the digestive juices of that plant will uh, suck the soft part of that insect out, and all that's left is that hard shell on the outside. Uh, the pitcher plants over there, um, which are called pitcher plants because of the way they grow basically, have another interesting way of trapping insects. Is uh, It's actually like a cage as there's hairs on the inside there. The insect finds a nice easy way to crawl down. Uh, when it gets to the bottom, the hairs are reversed. That insect can't crawl back up, gets too tired, falls into the digestive juices, and uh, it's dinner. Well, they are really bizarre, but wonderful plants. Yeah. And I think people should note, if they are going to try to grow them, that they can be quite difficult. Uh, the most important thing, like I said, is that dormant period that begins uh, in, in mid-October. It slowly dies back. It's like a bulb. It grows actually from a little corm or a little bulb inside that you have to uh, hold the water back and then start mm -hmm. growing next April again. That's true. Well, now, I know you have a very interesting house around the corner here that you want to show me next. Yeah, we'll walk through here and then we'll go into the fern house. How about that? Okay, great. Well, I hope that the Venus fly traps and the pitcher plants are a success for you. So do we. Oh, look at this, baby's breath. Now, most people only see this when they buy flowers for their indoor garden, although apparently it can grow outside, huh? It's Gypsophilia is its real name, and it does very well around here as a perennial. It's really cute. Before we go to the fern house, I want to show you the J. Edgar Hoover gardenias. Gardenias are one of the most elegant plants, I think, that you can have in the house, and certainly one of the best smelling. Uh, these particular gardenias once belonged to J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, he apparently liked gardenias. They're one of his favorite flowers. Uh, he would put these out on his patio each summer, mm. and each winter we would uh, we'd pick them up before the first frost, and we'd store them over the winter, and that's how we ended up with them. Boy, what a great system. Yep, this... It is a beautiful plant and quite large for a house plant. Uh, exactly. Most people are not very successful with growing these at home, and they look at ours and they want to know how they can do it. It's a very difficult plant to grow in the house in this area. Humidity becomes a real problem. Oh, this must be very old also. Uh, it's quite old. Uh, 
this is actually, I believe, the last one we have. There used to be four, now I think there's only one. Let's go on into the front house. Okay. Well, you know, ferns are about my most favorite plant. Well, that's something we have in common. They're my favorite plants as oh, well. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, some of my, 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 my very favorites, actually, are some of the hardy Japanese ferns. Uh, oh, yeah. Like the duty media uh -huh. or the polystichum. These are from usually oriental areas, and they're hardy in those areas. What I'd like to do is plant them over here and get them to grow uh, through our winters over here. Uh, some of the other interesting ferns in here are the, are the tree ferns. Uh, a lot they of times, are beautiful. Uh, aren't they they? Very are. Most of these come from uh, the Australia or the Pacific Rim. A uh, very interesting plant. Actually, a, a lot of the tree ferns are responsible for the fossil fuels that we burn today to heat our homes and to run our cars. Is that so? That's correct. Wow. And this one kind of reminds me of a uh, tree fern, except that you can buy them smaller and they'll actually grow in your home without too much trouble. This one that we're looking at here is actually a terrace tremula. It does very well in the house. Uh, very easy to care for. Uh, it gets large, but easily cut back, and you can maintain it as a small to medium-sized specimen. Oh, yes. And there's several varieties of terrace, aren't there, that people can grow? Exactly. Another uh, one of my favorites in this particular house. Oh, we passed it. Let's, can we go back? Sure, sure. Actually, We're, are the button oh, ferns. Oh, the button fern. The they button are fern, so the, cute. The aren't they? they don't even look like a. They're very a interesting. Fern. Uh, with with the almost the rounded shape uh, leaflets on on on, uh, on the fronds, and the interesting uh, croziers that they uh, they show. Oh yes. Most all ferns have some sort of crozier or fiddlehead. Uh, that's a pretty good indicator of, of ferns when you're uh, trying to make identifications of them. Right, it's how they open up. That's correct. Mm -hmm. What else do you want to show us in here? Uh, well, there's always the staghorns, uh, one oh, of the most un unusual ferns. It's magnificent. Called a staghorn or elkhorn fern sometimes uh, because the uh, fronds resemble the, uh, the, the uh, horns of elks or different stags. Uh, one really interesting thing about uh, staghorn ferns is they're epiphytic ferns. Uh, they normally grow in the mm -hmm. crotches of trees. Uh, they have the ability to take most of what they need right out of the air. Uh, this particular one, the uh, Platycerium vasi here, uh, if you notice the fronds are more upright than uh, some of the other staghorn ferns. Uh, that particular one has upright ferns to help, cap, uh, help capture moisture in its native environment and it'll channel it right down into the, uh, to the root mass. Uh, another tree fern here, one of my favorites. And actually an interesting You can fern. see how large they really do get. <laughs> and this is actually small. Uh, in, in their normal uh, environment, these things will grow to 50 feet. Uh, one plant we do have in here uh, is kind of a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, we call it sometimes, is the asparagus fern. Uh, most people think they're ferns. They're not really. They uh, have sort of been put there because they look a little bit like ferns. Uh, but this particular plant is actually a relative of the garden asparagus. and. Uh, they do very well around here. You notice all the new growth on this one, quite large. It does. It's very nice. Yeah, they get nice and full, but they aren't really true ferns. No, that is a myth. They actually flower. The difference uh, there is the uh, most ferns don't flower. They reproduce by spores, where your asparagus ferns, if you've grown them in the house, you know that eventually they'll get little tiny white flowers right. on them. That's right. Well, the fern house is really lovely. The next uh, house we're going to walk through, Liz, is, is the dinosaur garden. This uh, is a garden that's planted in uh, plants that uh, are representatives of plants that would have lived during the dinosaur era. Uh, some of the more interesting plants in here, actually two very interesting plants, are the sago palms, oh, also yes. nine, known as cycads. Uh, these particular plants are ancient plants that have been around for uh, at least 150 million years. Uh, they're relatives of the spruce and fir trees that, that we have today. Uh, they have, like I said, separate sexes. This particular one happens to be a female. Uh, you can tell by that flower formation, the silver or the reddish flower formation at the top. Uh, and a little further up here, we're going to come to a male uh, cycad. Uh, the foliage is the same, but you can tell the male by the sure cone is. formation. Uh, it usually sends out one cone a year. And also left, you can see our last year's cones. Uh, and what happens is on these is the pollen uh, from the male uh, cones blows across, 
to the female uh, flower, and it takes as much as a year for that flower to pollinate. But they are patient, aren't they? are very patient. Uh, that's why they've been able to survive for a couple hundred uh, million years. I guess so. Now, they've actually survived through the Ice Age, Exactly correct? right. Uh, these plants, they can trace back uh, and have actually found fossils that are over 200 million years old. Oh, look at this. It's a, it almost looks like a ficus ali. What's its name? Uh, this is actually a ficus species, a uh, relative of the ficus uh, plants that we grow in our houses. We've got quite a few different ones. Uh, this is a fiddle leaf fig. The fiddle leaf uh, over here, another sure ficus do. over here, the ficus liatra, fiddle leaf fig. Boy, that's a big specimen. I don't think you'd get that one in your <laughs> house, could you? I don't think so. <laughs> And this is a great specimen, too, of the rubber tree. Right, this is a uh, ficus elastica, or the common rubber plant. Oh, yes. Again, another big specimen. Right, it's huge. <laughs> the next house we're going to walk into, uh, we call the epiphyte house, because most of the plants here are epiphytic plants. And that means they live on trees, right? Live on trees and have the ability to take uh, the nutrients and moisture right out of the air. Uh, one that that you might be familiar with and can be grown as a house plant is a Santherium. Oh, yes. The flower is commonly seen in the florist as a cut flower and it holds up very, very well. This is a pretty, pretty one. Another interesting uh, bromeliad that uh, maybe most people aren't familiar with as a bromeliad is the pineapple plant, the, the variegated one with the yellow stripes, and, and actually you can see the beginning of a pineapple starting to form That's on that. That's quite amazing, isn't it, how they come out like that? Exactly. Bromeliads are interesting because they uh, trap rainwater and have the ability to water themselves. They do. Another smart plant. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, the bromeliads in their normal environment will live in the tops of trees, similar to like the staghorn ferns we talked about earlier. Oh, yeah. And they'll take uh, what they need right out of the air. <laughs> Another interesting thing, there's one species of tree frog that actually will lay its eggs in the, in the uh, vase of a bromeliad, and that frog will never ever live on the ground. It lives its whole lifetime right up in the tree. It'll, perform, it'll uh, form a tadpole right in the vase of that, uh, that bromeliad. Another epiphytic plant, uh, we've got some orchids in, in this particular house. Uh, this is uh, an orchid not in bloom right now, but uh, orchids are also epiphytic plants, have the ability to take their uh, nutrients and, uh, and moisture right out of the air. That's a Catalea orchid. There are a lot of orchids in here, yeah, too. Look there's, at those. There's what another, an there's another flower. interesting. I'm not sure the scientific name of that one, but that one is uh, called the spider orchid, and you can see why it's called the spider orchid. Yep, that's understandable. <laughs> <laughs> the next house we're going to come to, uh, we call this the uh, American Desert House, uh, so called because all the plants in here are native to uh, the deserts of the American Southwest. What's well, really impressive. Uh, one that uh, you might recognize there is a yucca, again, a giant specimen. It certainly is a giant specimen, but it's gorgeous. Another interesting plant in here is this uh, variegated century plant, or agave americana is its uh, scientific name. Uh, it's called a uh, century plant because basically it blooms every 100 years. Uh, another uh, thing that this plant is, uh, is used for is... Uh, you can make tequila out of this plant. Uh, it's grown in Mexico in, in sort of a nursery situation, and tequila is uh, made from that. So it is plant. valuable. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, a couple other plants that uh, are interesting here are the saguaro cactuses. Uh, the saguaro cactus is the one right here. Uh, it doesn't have its common arms. Uh, most people That's recognize right. saguaros by their arms. Uh, but this particular saguaro hasn't uh, quite reached its maturity yet, which is about 75 years old. And when it hits 75, it should send up its first arm. And the last place I want to show you, Liz, was uh, our endangered plant exhibit. Uh, the Botanic Garden is, is a plant rescue center. And any plants that are legally shipped into the country, the Customs Service will confiscate those plants and send them to one of, uh, we are one of 40 actual plant rescue centers in the United States. 
Uh, some of the endangered plants uh, that, that you might not be uh, aware of are some of the pathiopedilums or the lady slipper orchids are all on the endangered list. Oh. As well as encephalardos mm -hmm. and uh, some of the cycads that we looked at earlier in the, uh, in the cycad house. And tree ferns uh, are all illegal to ship into this country without proper documentation. Uh, the reason being is uh, most people that will go out and, and steal plants will also uh, ruin some of the, the fragile areas around them, and that's why it's illegal to, uh, to harvest certain plants and ship them into this country. Uh, so we are allowed to, to receive them, propagate them, and uh, share them with other botanic gardens, scientists, and uh, other uh, scientific institutions throughout the country. Oh, well that's a great thing to do keep that monitored so that we still can enjoy these kind of plants several years from now. Exactly. Well, Wally, I really appreciate you giving us this tour today. The Botanic Garden is really fascinating. I think everybody should come out at some point and take a look at it. Just thousands and thousands of plants, and a lot of them you may even recognize from your own home. Thank you so much, Wally, for this wonderful tour of the Botanic Gardens. You're welcome.